Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Day two of Edelmetall Messi here in Munich and Commodity TV is here live on stage with you. And we want to talk first thing in the morning to Uranium Royalty. And uh, we have here Scott Melby, the CEO of the company. Welcome and good morning, Scott. Great. Good, good morning. <laughs> it's great to be here uh, and a very exciting uh, Edelmetall uh, uh, conference. So uh, we're Fantastic. thrilled to participate. Yeah, super. Scott, thank you very much for taking the time. I would say you are really like a Uranium legend a bit <laughs> to me because you were the former president of Cameco so you are mm -hmm. long long time in the business you also had the cycle already 2005 to 7 I would call it yeah so uranium royalty let's get first started with that before we come to the new cycle um, I think it's a very interesting business model which we know already from gold royalties mm -hmm. from silver royalties from streams so how does your business model work and mm. what have you achieved this year yeah, so we, uh, uh, about five years ago, a number of the co-founders of Uranium Royalty uh, looked out at the base and precious metals royalty and streaming companies like Franca Nevada, Wheat and Precious, and we just remarked how uh, incredible it was that there wasn't an, an equivalent company in the uranium space. So we set forward uh, to list the company first on the TSX and then uh, more more recently on the NASDAQ exchange. And so we are the the only pure play uh, royalty and streaming company in the uranium space today and it's very good timing because uh, you know a, a royalty and streaming company doesn't just acquire existing royalties which is uh, all of our acquisitions to date have been in, in that sort of secondary market for existing royalties but we're also a capital provider to new miners and developers that are going to come through um, you know, in the second half of this decade and bring on new mine developments and we can provide the capital to them to help them come on and exchange for a royalty, a financial interest in their uh, ultimate production or a physical interest. We can take physical uranium uh, from their mine as payment for the upfront uh, capital provided. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a great model in a really exciting commodity at the right time in the cycle. Absolutely. I mean, the cycle, as said, we talk in a minute. So how many royalties have you done so far? Um, what is, let's say, the financial situation of the company mm -hmm. these days? Yeah, so uh, we're still a very young company, but we're quite proud of our, our inaugural uh, royalty portfolio. We have 15 royalties uh, in Africa, Canada, and the United States. Uh, some of the most noteworthy would be royalty interests on Cigar Lake and MacArthur River with Arano and Cameco in Saskatchewan, Canada. Um, we've increased our, uh, in the last year, we've increased our royalty coverage of Peninsula's Lance ISR uranium mine in Wyoming. Uh, and then we also uh, got Langer Heinrich. All of these operations are uh, either in production now or are restarting production as the uranium price recovers. So uh, uh, again, we uh, uh, very proud of the, the portfolio we have, but the job one for me is to really be out there and feed the pipeline for new new royalties. And uh, for me, this is the best part of my job, is to go out and meet with the counterparties, uh, learn about their operations, find out how we can come alongside. Uh, in many cases, we're finding uh, a number of developers are having to buy advanced long lead time items and equipment in their processing and, and production facilities. And a royalty model uh, fits that very nicely where we can provide the financing for something that they may order today yeah and arrive you know, six to nine months down the road. And, yeah. and a, a traditional financing or lenders probably wouldn't uh, go to that extreme, mm. but we, we understand the uranium business. Uh, that's well, what you've got to do say. to get back into production. <laughs> so. Perfect. So <laughs> what, what royalties are cash flowing already? Or let's say, what do you need for some royalties which are quite close to go to cash flow, meaning go, going in production? Is the uranium price of today already fine for them? Or do you, would you say, huh, maybe it would be better if we see $65, $70 per pound on an ongoing basis? Yeah, I think what's happened in, in the last year or so is we are seeing utilities really increase their contracting cycle. So a number of our counterparties have seen uh, significant long-term contracting at prices that they feel will be sufficient for them to restart. Now, restart isn't quick. Um, you know, probably our nearest term cash flowing royalties on MacArthur River, the, the big uh, mine in Saskatchewan. Um, they're expected to produce two million pounds uh, this year and, and we're already in November, so it'll be production coming in late in the year. But uh, <coughs> they're uh, certainly ramping back up at MacArthur River. Uh, Cigar Lake has been in production. 
but is still going to kind of be um, uh, throttling back a bit and not producing at full production. So that may delay a little bit uh, how, when and, and how we get paid. But once uh, our royalties kick in at Cigar, it'll be bigger than, than MacArthur. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're very encouraged to see both those moving forward. Uh, in, in Wyoming, uh, the Lance Project is, uh, is advancing uh, kind of a, a feasibility study to, to um, really detail their uh, process of changing their production mm -hmm. from a sodium uh, bicarbonate leach to a, uh, a low acid pH leach. And so we're eager to see the results of, of, of that uh, study that should come out soon. Um, and Langer Heinrich has been also signing contracts and intends to come back into production in Namibia in the uh, course of, uh, of next year. So okay. we're getting there. Uh, obviously, we're an industry where we were quite happy to have uranium production shut in. That's what needed to happen to rebalance the market. The production discipline over the last four or five years has really rebalanced the market to a point now where um, the excess inventories are pretty much depleted and gone and helped by uh, speculative buyers like Sprott, uh, phys uh, Physical Uranium Trust, and others like UEC and URC that have been buying uranium off the spot market. We pretty much have a market now which has is, is, is drained the spot market of the excess supplies. Yeah. Now we're in a production uh, driven market uh, in the coming months and years, which will really, uh, I think, result in everything I'm seeing as a supply squeeze in 24, 25, 26. We think even in the the utility companies that are buying the uranium see that tightness developing in that time frame. And as we know, markets are a bit forward looking. So uh, if there is a squeeze developing in 2024, I would expect more speculative buying uh, that will uh, throw a little gasoline on the fire in 23. So Absolutely, yeah. And I think also <coughs> the war with uh, Ukraine is something which is not really helping probably. And uh, well, how do you see the situation with Kassadam from uh, St. Petersburg to ship and enrich the uranium, mm -hmm. uh, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, the whole situation there? Because I could imagine that's a heavy impact longer term also on the market, right? Yeah, I mean, we've had a, a number of key mega trends that have come together. Obviously, the, the, the difficult transition to green energy has highlighted how important nuclear is in the mix. And so that's really driving things. But the, the war and the invasion of, of Ukraine by Russia really highlighted the importance of uh, energy independence. And energy independence really means national and energy security. And so uh, utilities uh, obviously are not contracting with Russia for new contracts. And we're really debating in the United States Congress um, not whether Russia should be banned, but how quickly. Should it be immediate? Should it be gradual over three years? So we're, we're at that stage now, but the, the important thing is uh, the buyers, the consumers of uranium are now looking to stable jurisdictions. They're looking to Canada, the United States, um, and, and, and wanting to source uranium that isn't tied up in the Russian world. Because Adamprom is a big question mark. Uh, I think in a world which divides into the Russian sphere of influence and the Western European uh, American sphere of influence, I'm pretty sure Kazakhstan goes with Russia, even though they say they're independent, they say they're trying to get uh, exports out through the Black Sea, uh, but I think when push comes to shove, their neighbors are China and Russia, and that production will be probably uh, very coveted by those two countries. So I think Kazatomprom could be producing at their licensed capacities, but I really wonder, um, you know, five years from now, how much of that uranium is actually coming to the West. And that's an important consideration, uh, mm -hmm. which is why uh, URC is looking to, well, who are the companies in the West that can bring on production in the second half of the decade? And we want to come alongside and support them with investments. And in our, our you know, our uh, major shareholder, Uranium Energy Corp, obviously very well positioned with mines, production platforms in Texas and Wyoming, and now investments in Saskatchewan, Canada. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we were always talking about 440 nuclear power plants these days in, pro in uh, production, or in work, let's call it yep. that, in power production. I think today it's 426 because the French had to shut down something. Where do you see the development, especially after um, the Chinese saying, oh, we want to invest $440 billion in 150 mm -hmm. new power plants. How do you see the SMR development, yeah. the small modular reactors? How would that change the demand uh, balance in the world? Yeah, I mean, the, the growth of nuclear power, I think we've had um, 
you know, the number of, of, of plants, uh, 65 new plants come online in the last nine years, another 56 uh, uh, under construction. Uh, even if that was the extent of the growth, that would be very significant to growth in uranium requirements. But we're now seeing, um, you know, countries in Central Europe, I think Central Europe, Poland, Romania, Czech Republic, this is the, uh, I think, the fastest growing market now outside of Asia. Why? Because these countries are being pressured by the European Union to move away from coal, but then they can't turn and, and rush into the arms of Russia for gas and have no intention of doing mm. so. So nuclear really is an answer for them. So running their existing, sometimes Russian-built reactors on Western fuel and Western uranium, and building SMRs, and, and Poland, I mean, made huge investments uh, and announcements last week on new nuclear reactors, big reactors in Poland, but they're also pursuing SMRs, these smaller factory-built 100, 200 megawatt units that uh, I think we'll see hundreds if not thousands of these coming online in the next 20 years. So yeah. Very exciting development. Stupid question maybe, but how much uranium consumes such a small entity? Yeah, so uh, a small modular reactor, if it's 100 uh, megawatts, it's much less, it's much smaller than a 1600 megawatt reactor. Um, and they may, you know, they all have different fuel cycles uh, depending on the design. So each reactor uses less uranium, but if you build enough of them, uh, that's a very significant uh, demand. I think the U.S. nuclear utilities uh, were surveyed recently and indicated that they see 90 gigawatts of new uh, nuclear, mainly SMR capacity being built in the U.S. in the next 20, 25 years. That's 300 SMRs, and we're seeing it. We're seeing them coming to Wyoming, Idaho, Washington State. Yeah. It's interesting because these are all coal uh, uh, states, and yeah. so similar to the Central European, uh, dilemma. They're having to move away from coal. They can't rely too heavily on wind and solar because they're just not reliable. They're too intermittent in nature. So uh, SMRs seem to be the, the go-to source for new generation. So it could be easily like 10 million pounds plus per year oh, yeah. on excess I, demand. Yeah, and I, I think largely speaking, these have not been factored into supply and demand. So we've been saying the world uses 200 million pounds of uranium annually and increasing. But I think when you layer in uh, and these uh, new small plants kind of materialize and, and are coming, you know, I mean, many of them are intended to be up in operation before the end of the decade. I think we have a real boost to uranium demand at a time when production's lagging demand currently by about 50 million pounds a year. So uh, uh, I think uh, the bullish case for uranium has never been better in my 38 uh, years. And uh, <laughs> I love to hear that. <laughs> so for investors to be, to be uh, positioned uh, with the uranium companies and uranium royalty uh, corp is a great way to get diversified pure play exposure to the uranium and nuclear energy story. Fantastic. Final question. What is your personal price target for uranium price within the next, let's say, two, three years? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think with inflation and everything else, the, the, the hurdle rate for new mine development may have increased in the last two years, maybe as much as $10 a pound. So, I mean, I think the best mines in the world can restart in a $60 market comfortably, but a lot of mines need you know, big upfront capital, much higher. So I don't think we should judge how high the uranium market goes from the past 10 or 15 years. I think we have to look at it very differently. And some of these sh supply shocks like Russia being cut off or them cutting us off uh, could put things, uh, and again, in this 20, 2024, 25, 26 time frame we could see prices significantly uh, higher, maybe as much as double as where, where they are today. A double, so that's a good hundred dollars. That's what <laughs> I wanted to hear. <laughs> Super, I always want to have a price target. <laughs> Super, Scott, thank you very much yep. uh, for your time and uh, really highly appreciated uh, what you have said about the markets and everything, because I know, you are so, as you said, 38 years, you are so deep inside. Yeah. Always highly mm. valued uh, that you share this with us. And I wish you all the best. And uh, I'm a shareholder of the company. I'm a shareholder in UEC. Good. I'm a total uranium bull, that Good. is for sure. Yeah. Um, because I think that would help the world a lot to decarbonize. Absolutely. And uh, so from that perspective, I think we are in the right environment uh, and time is working for us. 
Absolutely. We have a lot to offer and uh, exciting times. Super. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, that was Scott Melby, the CEO of Uranium Royalty Corporation. Yeah, you heard it. Uh, things are going extremely well. Um, they have over 15 uh, Uranium Royalties already and the first cash flowing will start probably yeah, beginning of next year. And uh, they have a lot in the pipeline, but also they are very positive for the Uranium market, but more on a conservative pace. Uh, Scott is 38 years in the business and he really understands uh, how the cycles work and how the markets work. So $100 is also what my price target is, is the next. And uh, yeah, we are extremely positive on everything. Check out Uranium Royalty. Check also out Uranium Energy Corporation. I think two companies you really should uh, have a very, very close look on. I'm a shareholder in both companies. Thanks for watching us. Bye-bye from Edelmetall Messe in Munich.